All right, folks, we're here at the uh, Waco compound. Right behind me there is the, uh, the current church, the front door here. I've talked to the guy here quite a bit today. I'm kind of at the end, I'm fixing to leave actually, but this is the intro obviously. But the front door there actually is positioned pretty much exactly where the front door to the original compound was. The flagpole right here, I'm gonna show you. It's in the same location as the original flagpole. Y'all got to come out here and check this out. Peter, the uh, preacher's assistant here, he gave me a pretty lengthy story today, and I'm going to include a whole bunch of it in this video. Y'all stick around. I think y'all are going to enjoy this. Off with a uh, a look at an aerial photo of the structure uh, prior to the raid. Okay, and you'll notice it says chapel. We're actually right now standing in the chapel area, although we're not in the original chapel because that original chapel was, of course, destroyed. But we're actually in a church built over the foundation of the old chapel in 1999. It was done by volunteers, patriots, called the Phoenix Project. Um, you'll also notice on that photo uh, that there's a vault area. We'll uh, take a walk in just a minute and we'll go out there and uh, look at what's left of the vault, talk about that. Um, also where it says school bus, uh, we'll be walking out uh, to take a look at that. That is located right about at the end of where the structure ended and we're right about at the sp spot where the structure started. Um, also you'll notice uh, to the right on the photo is a pool and we'll go out and look at that pool. That's something interesting that's still left here even after the, uh, uh, the raid in 1993. All right, so uh, now uh, this uh, spot we're standing right here is actually the foundation of the old gym. And then if we just turn around uh, a little bit to my right, you'll notice at that spot there's now some plants, some planters on top of it, but that's actually the foundation of the old chapel. And as you can see, the current church building is built over the foundation of the old chapel. If we come forward here, next we're gonna look at the foundation of what's called a vault area. Um, now I think that this vault area is just about the most tragic uh, memory uh, of the whole standoff because of what happened here now. Originally, uh, this vault had great big tall walls uh, above the current roof of the church or the bottom of its roof anyway. And uh, also this vault area was used uh, like a, uh, a, a root cellar and a place to store food. So it had a, a bottom portion, a root cellar. Now, right now it's filled in with some concrete and rocks and stuff just to keep it safer for children. But ultimately, or in the past, it was not filled in like that. So there was more room down there. And the tragedy of the vault is that the, um, our men decided, uh, the church members decided, typical warfare decision to take the unarmed women and children and uh, let them shelter in this vault area because it seemed like that was going to be a safe place where they could be separate from the gunfighting. And uh, since they were unarmed, uh, the hopes were that they would be preserved. Sadly, the opposite occurred as revealed by the testimony of the tank commander uh, from the congressional hearings that happened after the standoff, where he testified that he followed his orders directly and specifically and drove his tank close enough to the vault area during the final day of the raid that he could see the mothers looking out uh, the door of the vault area and obeying his orders he shot his CS gas canisters directly down into the vault which looked like big metal jacket bullets but were actually gas canisters for CS gas. His commanders were then asked under oath at the time before Congress uh, what were the known warnings against using CS gas especially in a confined area but especially against children. And uh, all of them at that point supposedly, according to their testimony, developed collective amnesia. And they all testified they couldn't recall anything about that, didn't know anything about that. 
But we know because of the fact there's actually federal regulations where those type of potentially dangerous materials have to be labeled. We can easily reference the labeling and we know that what the warnings were at the time and even now are that that uh, CS gas is uh, not to be used in a confined area, especially with children, because when it's over concentrated, it causes extreme involuntary muscle contraction to the extent tragically that those uh, victims uh, remains that were found in the vault, it was shown they didn't die from fire or gunfire, but rather from uh, over intoxication of CS gas, which produces such extreme involuntary muscle contraction that they're literally, their heads were being pulled towards their tailbone till it's, their spine snapped. Horrible backward curled skeletons with the feet uh, nearly touching the head um, of the victims. And um, we even now know that the government was so embarrassed about that that they took means to right away uh, try to cover up part of what happened because we were actually contacted by retired Texas uh, DPS Highway Patrol who stated to us that during their duties uh, they were called upon in 1993, after the, just after the standoff ended, to form a human perimeter around the structure during the initial phases of the nine-month cleanup. And they told us that as investigators, they saw things that made them uncomfortable. They had some photos. And one of the things that they mentioned is uh, that there was a dump truck pulled uh, right up to this vault area, uh, even before the fire was out, and personnel were observed unloading automatic rifles right down into this vault area. And and likely uh, that was done for purposes of developing photography to justify the tragedy that happened in the vault. But um, in actuality, uh, sadly, these um, mothers and children were unarmed, but nevertheless uh, died in a tragic manner. Um, let's go ahead and now and uh, walk towards the pool area. Based on what we see here today, but it's also significant based on what happened here even before David arrived. This pool is one of the keys, I would say, to what's called the untold story uh, of Waco, the new revelation. And uh, essentially, uh, some interesting things and facts about this pool. For one, you'll notice a darker edge just above the water line. Um, that is actually a, a ring of ashes from 1993 uh, that was discovered uh, when the pastor, our current pastor, drained out this whole pool. Um, in the late 90s, I believe 98, and uh, took away uh, debris, material, drained the water, and discovered this ring of ashes that's still present just above the water line. Um, what's also interesting is that this pool was originally the basement of a giant metal roof machine shed. And However, David indicated when he returned to the property from Palestine, Texas in 1987 that he could not use this machine shed. He indicated that it was actually desecrated and based on what he found. And so he tore it up, turned it into the current pool. Uh, you'll notice he paved uh, the far end of it and you can see how that's more of a gentle slope. And also you'll notice, and we'll walk over here closer, there's a set of stairs um, at the end of the pool. And uh, what's interesting is David actually left graffiti on the second stair of the pool. Um, we'll take a look at that. And uh, also what's interesting about this pool is the current pastor let me put some beautiful Japanese koi in it. And um, they're thriving in it even to this day. So David wrote DK92 and included a Star of David in his graffiti that he left just in time while he was able to do so. Okay, so um, this area here is where the old uh, water well and water tower area was. Prior to the raid, it actually houses a 3,000-foot artesian well that the government decided to, even when the raid was over but before they left, to smash the pipes of that, add dry cement, and then uh, pour wet cement on top of that. So it's made it uh, fairly difficult to get back to that water source, but it still uh, exists and has a great potential, the 3,000-foot artesian well. Um, over here, uh, we're going to look at uh, the school bus uh, area. 
And again, this school bus is not in very good shape because on uh, April 19th of 1993, the government did put charges on this school bus to prevent the church members from escaping in the direction of the school bus, which was built as an underground tunnel from the large uh, structure so that in traveling directly to the storm shelter area and to prevent the church uh, members from escaping from the CS gas in that area, the government put charges on it. Uh, so this school bus is in a fairly mangled state, but it is what's left of the school bus uh, tunnel area from the original structure. And we'll look now towards storm shelter area which the school bus tunnel was leading to. A um, couple interesting things about this storm shelter is that um, you can see by looking at it that it looks like an even the remnants of an even older structure perhaps a, a basement area from a larger older structure and the Homeland Security investigator Ken Fawcett uh, who did a lot of research out there out here and spoke to us he actually indicated that uh, it's his belief that this is what remains of uh, the World War II um, United States um, Japanese internment uh, prison camp because there was one located right here but uh, uh, Ken Fawcett said he believes that this was what's left of the command center uh, George Roden accepted funding and uh, as well as a workforce to build a giant metal roof machine shed. Now we can see a picture of this machine shed um, in the bottom frame of the red poster, which is introducing and previewing the pastor's book on this subject, Waco, A New Revelation for the Children's Sake. And again, um, I recommend if you would like a, a deeper and a more documented and a more detailed uh, presentation than what I'm giving right here, I would refer you to the pastor's book um, because uh, it's a great souvenir. He's pre-signed all these books and also um, he goes into in a detailed manner um, all the information that I'm talking about now, but I'm just kind of giving a preview, making it a little bit uh, briefer for time's sake. So um, this large metal roof building then that George had erected within a week of kicking all the church members off the property in 1985 um, is quite an inter What's interesting about it is it is, or the basement rather of that building is the current pool that is still on the property to this day. Because in 1987, when David returned to the property, he announced in his newsletter written in 1988 that he found that uh, metal roof building, built in 85 while he was gone. And you know, normally we'd think he would have wanted to use that uh, for apartments or some use because he had about 100 people to house. And this was prior to him building up his whole superstructure. Uh, but he actually announced in his newsletter that that building was desecrated because of evidence that he found in it and that he had to tear it up and called it a water cleansing and turned it into the current pool. I'll explain the reason why David got access to all that information and it's because what happened is when David was initially wanting to return in 1987, George Roden was still in control of the property. But uh, George was actually digging in the front of the property uh, trying to fix a water main break and came across an old church graveyard. And at that point, he decided to uh, uh, open up a casket and he found uh, the body of Anna Hughes, a one-armed church member that had been buried for some time. And he came up with kind of the harebrained idea to uh, challenge David and say, we'll see who the true prophet is. We'll see who can resurrect his dead body. So David, I think, initially did uh, the, the smart thing. He actually approached his target practicing buddy, former Sheriff Harwell, who would actually come right here to this property right about up until the raid and take target practice with David out in the field behind me. Um, now, uh, however, the sheriff ended up telling David that, you know, he knew that George and David had a long rivalry about who would control this property. And so he couldn't just take David's word alone as evidence. Uh, to arrest George, even though it would be a crime to desecrate a, a dead body in a tomb. So what happened is David then came up with the idea that um, uh, doesn't seem to be the best idea to me 
to take a group of five armed followers and try to sneak past George's place, which is where the single wide currently sits on the property. And uh, they were actually dressed in full camouflage and were trying to crawl uh, down the ditch next to the, the road that's there past George's uh, single wide to get to a large building that was located just to my left at the time, it's no longer there, where that uh, casket was housed. Take pictures of it, give those pictures to the sheriff and get George arrested so that then they could come back to the property. The problem is, right about when they got past George's place, um, George was somehow alerted to them, came literally rolling out of his place, spraying machine gun fire at them. He still had an Israeli machine gun from the time when the church uh, was running Amarine, uh, the kibbutz in Israel. And nevertheless, even being sprayed with automatic fire, uh, David uh, was a crack shot and was able to uh, pin George behind the tree that is currently in front of the single wide. Now there's smaller trees planted all the way along the road for each victim that died, but there's a slightly larger tree I'm referring to that's in front of the single white. Now, uh, he was taking shelter behind the tree with his back to the tree. Nevertheless, George was actually a very large man, so was still sticking out a little bit from the sides of the tree, took a ricocheted bullet to his thumb, was screaming, bloody murder. And at that point, uh, the neighbors here did what most neighbors in this country would do upon hearing a, a bunch of gunfire and screaming, they called it in. They called the authorities. And when the authorities arrived, they arrested the whole group. But again, this wasn't David's larger group. It was the five he brought, David and George. When that proceeded through the criminal justice system here in Waco, David and his followers were actually found not guilty and freed. But George uh, got a hung jury, was furious, started pounding the table. Interesting note, too, is that George also had been diagnosed with Tourette syndrome. Um, so he was pounding the table in the courtroom, screaming that the judge and jury had delivered the wrong verdict and that therefore they were cursed with AIDS. The judge, of course, was telling him, you know, you'll get a contempt of court, threatening contempt, you know, order in the court and so forth. And because George continued to go on and on and on for quite some time, he ended up with six months of solid contempt time. So George, of course, didn't go home um, from jail that day, but remained for six months. And during that time, David then was able to roll right back on the property with his followers, with their buses, take over the whole property, pay all the back taxes, put everything into his name. And at that is the time when he discovered this uh, machine shed built in 85 when he was gone, discovered all the evidence uh, that I previously mentioned, tried to turn it over to uh, former Sheriff Harwell, who was his target practicing buddy. The sheriff told him at the time, I'm sorry, David, after checking, that's federal jurisdiction. I can't take that. I said, just you get rid of it. And David started um, doing that. So, uh, we, so we understand then that uh, there's two major lessons that we can take from it. We call one the, the spiritual revelation, which is that um, David, in fact, did play God. He agreed in 1984 during the pastor's sermon to be this apostate leader who would bring in um, a horrible judgment of Ezekiel 28, but really to show the lesson, to illustrate the lesson that if we refuse the Holy Ghost, the Lamb of Revelation 5, and pick another person in her place. We can do that because we're given free will by God, but it's leaving the path of wisdom described in Proverbs 8 and entering onto the path of destruction, the opposite path. But also, it wasn't just David that played God. It was, in fact, uh, as well, government personnel, including the Clintons, that decided to play God and act like, especially in terms of cover-up, they could just take this whole um, scenario and uh, even just wipe out uh, human lives and do whatever they wanted to do. They literally did also play God. And we think that part of the lesson there is that uh, there will also, even though judgment begins in the house of God, 1 Peter 4.17, and that was one of the primary teachings of our founder, Victor Hodef, he emphasized that there would be a judgment in the house of God, according to Ezekiel 9, that, that we were to watch out for it. We understand that it occurred in 1993, but then also then the judgment uh, goes even beyond uh, the church, and we understand that even now our government is under judgment, and that's one reason why we're finding that so many corruptions within our government are being revealed and brought to light, because before God judges, He reveals. So uh, another interesting fact is that David, uh, you know, after uh, initially coming here in 81 and some time passed, uh, David decided because he did want to be the leader here uh, that uh, he wanted to have a relationship with Lois. 
So he was able to convince her. Now remember, Lois was a very religious woman, so uh, it wasn't just a, you know, a typical pickup or something, but he was able to convince Lois that there was a prophecy to be fulfilled from Isaiah, the Maher Shal Hashbash prophecy, that they should have a son and uh, convinced her that they needed to uh, have the son together. And interestingly enough, even in her old age, Lois became pregnant. But she did have a miscarriage, at which point David was furious, said that it was because of her lack of faith, uh, began to marry the younger women almost as a slap in the face to her. Um, now, it wasn't until, however, 1987, after David left in 84, returned in 87, uh, that David actually officially took over the whole church, had things put into his name, and renamed the church the Davidian, Branch Davidian Seventh-day Adventist Church. And uh, at that point became the official leader of the church in 1987. Okay, so uh, again, this pool area is interesting. Um, David converted this into a pool. It was a large metal roof machine shed. Now, you'll notice just above the waterline a ring of ashes, but the pastor let me start putting some beautiful Japanese koi into the pool um, last year. And uh, I'll feed them now, and you'll notice uh, that not only are there large koi, uh, but uh, there are as well uh, many baby koi because they have spawned multiple, multiple times. And I understand this to be uh, a representation of what the Bible calls beauty for ashes because still we have the sad remnant of the ashes just above uh, the, the water line in the pool, but also um, we now have something beautiful, alive and growing that God has permitted. These beautiful koi, they've spawned more times than I can count. Uh, so just a start of the beauty for ashes, which really is our goal now for this whole property. The old name for this property before it was ever called Waco was called Jerusalem and the Brazos de Dios, which means Jerusalem in the arms of God. We believe this to be the Jerusalem of our continent, a place of safety and sanctuary. But just like Nazareth of old, they said nothing good can come out of Nazareth. It has gained a reputation as uh, a bad bad place but we think now in this time of beauty for ashes that we're just being blessed incredibly and um, that this is a place for God's people um, a special sanctuary place and uh, we're also building up agriculturally we have um, just in front of me a permaculture garden um, that I'm starting over there and as well as we're starting a moringa orchard uh, the wonderful moringa tree the tree of life so our goal is just to continue to build this property up um, as time goes by and as people visit us it's our goal to have more and more to offer we have uh, quite a few plans and the prophecy in Haggai says that ultimately this place will be known not just for the tragedy of the past from 93 but also for the actual Edenic restoration uh, that will happen here and we think we're just on the edges of that but it's ongoing. Um, another interesting detail is that uh, the original property was 967 acres and then when Florence Hodef did the fraudulent sale, Ben Roden was only able to buy back 77.8 acres. David decided to relitigate that. He hired a hotshot lawyer who relitigated that and was successful in all the proceedings and was actually scheduled to get this whole property returned to the church. The whole remainder of the 967 67 acres because we're on 77.8 acres so that was scheduled to happen on the day of the raid a very interesting detail we're still trying to document the connection but we think it's strange it would be a coincidence and also the uh the warrant application for the search warrant indicates the main point is that there were postal workers who noticed that there were parts for guns that could have been used to make automatic rifles, but also semi-automatic rifles. But we had a neighbor uh, who lived in that direction uh, who reported, uh, he was key on the warrant because he reported that, that um, he heard automatic gunfire. But we have a closer neighbor who's been a gun enthusiast, a gun hobbyist since the age of eight, that tells us he never heard automatic fire from the property he would have uh, he would have remembered it because that was his hobby and what's interesting is that same neighbor uh, uh, the one on the warrant approached the other neighbor after the raid and told him well I got 20,000 they gave me 20,000 what did they give you and our friend our neighbor friend said he was furious and said I wouldn't take anything from him but I would think for that kind of money boy you could go to most towns in America and uh, find a witness to say just about anything for 20 grand
All right, folks, we're wrapping this video up. This has been an absolute bucket list item for me. I mean, just, just unbelievable. Coming out here and seeing everything, matching everything up, where everything happened at, hearing the stories from Peter. It's unbelievable. Beautiful. It's the middle of nowhere. I'm talking about when you come out here, you're gonna drive through some nothing. That's what you're gonna drive through. Just, just heat and nothing, but it's beautiful. They've got here along the along the road here. They've got trees lined up, and there's a tree for every person. It's represented back here behind this wall. Anyhow, we're gonna wrap it up right here. Thank y'all for coming to the uh, channel today. Y'all don't mind? Do me a favor. My throat is so dry right now. Y'all send up a prayer for these people tonight, officers, everybody who was involved in this. Uh, doesn't matter. They're 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 law. They're they're, they're gone. Okay, don't judge them now. They're, they're already being judged. Anyways, we're going to get off of that, okay? Thank you all for joining the channel today. Like, share, and subscribe. And we'll catch you all on the next one, okay? Thanks. Bye.